Hello everybody, welcome to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be concluding chapter 1 of the AS Biology syllabus. If you are just joining my channel or if you've stumbled across this video for some reason, I would suggest that you start from the very beginning where I discuss introduction to cells and microscopy. That is the video titled chapter 1.1. Also, I would like you to know that on this channel I will be posting the chronological order of the AS Biology syllabus using notes from my classroom so if you're an AS biology student who's just starting out your journey or you're simply trying to revise for the exams then this channel is definitely for you don't forget to hit the subscribe button and share the link with your friends so that they are able to study with you as well so like I said today, I will simply be concluding chapter one. So this is going to be a very short video. I hope that you have been able to go into your textbook and to be able to identify the different organelles in an animal and plant cell. I also hope that you've been able to study their functions because that is very important. In many CAIE exams for papers one and two, you would find that you are often asked questions that have to do with the functions of the different organelles within the different types of cells. So for this activity, we're simply going to identify some of these organelles. So this is the nucleus, for example. The nucleus is usually within the animal cell. It's a secular structure and inside of it is the nucleolus. Sometimes if you're using a light microscope, you might be able to see these two, especially if they are well stained. The mitochondria is the organelle that has an inner membrane that has folds in it and this is important because we always say the inner membrane of the mitochondria is called the cristae and that inner membrane plays a big role in respiration. So when we cross over to A level content and discuss respiration you will see why this is important. The Golgi apparatus is the organelle over there. Um, the Golgi apparatus is usually confused with the endoplasmic reticulum simply because many people believe that they look alike. Something I usually tell students in order to be able to identify these two uh, correctly is to notice that the endoplasmic reticulum seems to have continuous folds within it, whereas the Golgi apparatus is just individual layers of similar looking um, strands. And that is the cell membrane. Like we said, the cell membrane is a partially permeable membrane that restricts the movement of molecules in and out of the cell. A question I usually ask students when I show them this image is what is wrong with this diagram? I'm sure you're thinking about it as well. What is possibly wrong here? It is the fact that it shows the animal cell as having two membranes. The animal cell only has one membrane. So please do not make this mistake. It only has one membrane and this shows it as having two membranes. Doing the same activity for the plant cell, you can see over here, this is the cell membrane. The cell membrane is the inner membrane of the plant cell, while the cell wall is the outer membrane. The important thing to know is that the cell wall is for rigidity and support, and as a mat so as a result of that, it creates the rigidity outside of the plant cell membrane so that the plant cell doesn't burst and also retains its structure, even when it takes up water. That's the cytoplasm where all the organelles are contained. The big vacant space, like I said, the organelle that looks like a big vacant space is the vacuole. Um, you have the nucleus, it has some material in it, and then the chloroplast, and again the mitochondria with the inner folded membrane. The important thing to note about mitochondria and chloroplast is that they both make ATP. However, they do this in two different processes. So the mitochondria is very important in respiration because that is where we make our ATP during the process of respiration. Again, this is A-level content in chapter 12 and we will be able to discuss it better when we cross over to A-level chapters. The chloroplast is also used to make ATP but its main function is not necessarily that. It traps light from the sun and uses that light energy to make starch or carbohydrates that are stored by the plants. This is for photosynthesis and when we cross over to chapter 13 at the end of our AS level syllabus you will be able to see how these processes work in detail. 
What is ATP and what does it do? ATP is the energy currency of the cell. So it is what supplies us with energy. As you can see in the image, it is made up of adenine and a ribose sugar, which then makes up adenosine. And it has three phosphate molecules attached to it. So the full meaning of ATP is adenosine triphosphate. And when you break the bonds between the phosphate molecules, you release a lot of energy, which is what ensures that we continue to function as normally as possible. The important thing to know as we conclude chapter one is that there are two different types of cells if you want to simplify everything. You have eukaryotic cells which would then be our plant and animal cells and you have what we call the prokaryotic cells and that includes bacteria. So when we speak of prokaryotes versus eukaryotes we're simply comparing a lesser form of cells which would be like bacterial cells to a more advanced more technical form of cell which would be plant and animal cells. Just looking at this image you can see already that the bacterial cell which is the prokaryotic cell is incredibly different for example it has a tail like organ called the flagellum it has projections from its surface that are called pili or pillars depending on um, what on whether or not it's singular or plural it has a plasma membrane it has its dna naked in the cytoplasm unlike a eukaryotic cell where the dna is inside the nucleus this table over here is just an explanation of the differences and similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells. As you can see, I have classified the differences according to characteristic, so you can differentiate based on cell size, DNA, ribosomes, rib endoplasmic reticulum, organelles, as well as the cell wall. So if you're able to read through this, um, you would be able to answer any question that asks you to compare a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. For example, something that's very common with prokaryotes is that their DNA is circular and it lies free in the cytoplasm which means it is naked whereas with the eukaryotes the DNA is not circular and it is contained in a nucleus and we also have ribosomes in the prokaryotes being smaller they are 70s ribosomes whereas ribosomes in eukaryotes are 80s ribosomes the prokaryotes do not have an endoplasmic reticulum whereas eukaryotes have an endoplasmic reticulum prokaryotes also have very few organelles not of these organelles are membrane bound so for example when we looked at the mitochondria previously we saw that it had two membranes when it comes to prokaryotes their organelles don't have membranes they simply lie free in the cytoplasm and we also have the cell wall um, which in prokaryotes contains and peptidoglycan whereas uh, with eukaryotes we have cell walls in plants uh, but we don't have cell walls in animals the last bit that I want to touch on is viruses. So if you're living in the time of COVID-19, I'm pretty sure you have learned a little bit about viruses. Viruses are non-cellular structures. As a matter of fact, the easiest way to remember what a virus is made of is to just know that it is made of genetic material, which is either DNA or RNA, and it has a protein coat. So what viruses do is that they attach themselves to living cells within either the body or the plant, depending on on what it is they are trying to infect they release their DNA into that cell so that the cell's machinery can copy their DNA and help them make more of their DNA which would then result in more viral proteins being made. So it is important to know that viruses are non-cellular structures, they are disease-causing organisms, they are smaller than bacteria, they are self-replicating, um, they have self-replicating DNA or RNA which is a genetic material and they have a protein coat called a capsid. That capsid is made up of molecules called capsules and what they do is that they take over living cells to replicate themselves so I usually tell my students when to think of viruses to think of the movie Troy for example somewhere in the movie towards the end you see that the Spartans gave the Troy uh, community a wooden horse and inside the horse there were all these soldiers who were hiding so when the horse got into the center of Troy the soldiers climbed out and they burned down the city in the same way viruses attach themselves to cell surfaces and they release their DNA into the cell, the cell unsuspecting would then make more of their DNA and then they wreak havoc within the body or within the plant. So viruses are very, very dangerous and it is very hard to deal with them. 
so that is the end of it for me today i'm just concluding chapter one like i said if you have any questions any clarifying questions or details you want me to cover please ask a question in the chat and i will get back to you with an answer thank you so much for watching don't forget to hit the subscribe button have a good time